Hi, and welcome back to another lecture in our Methods in Ecology. We're going to get into here uh, logistic regressions. Logistic regressions are uh, an attempt to explain binary data. So uh, binary data might be something as uh, simple as a really bad Sudoku uh, puzzle. It's an either-or scenario where you're trying to explain uh, either ones or zeros in data or um, to be more socially uh, aware, uh, we could use Keith Knight's very clever cartoon about the apparent dichotomy between uh, how black and white people are treated by police. So logistic regressions are dealing with a binary situation. A logistic regression is where you have either ones or zeros on the y-axis. Now, in ecological contexts, those might be uh, presence and absence of a species and locations, uh, perhaps whether uh, plants are alive or dead at a certain time of the year. Um, yes, no kind of data on uh, surveys, true, false kinds of outcomes in models. Um, lots of other things might be thought of as binary. So we've been dealing with continuous data all semester where you think about things as much more of a uh, lots of range of digits and lots of uh, decimal places. It, but you should recognize that binary data are actually pretty commonly used in a lot of ecological and evolutionary analyses, whether a gene is uh, turned on or not, if it's upregulated, etc. So it turns out that we actually collect quite a bit of binary data and we need to be clever in analyzing it. Well, this is a pretty well worked out uh, method, as you might guess from a graph like this where there is a response or there is not. And as you can see from the dots down here, those negative responses, the zeros, tend to switch over to positive responses at some middle range of the temperatures shown here. And that's what a logistic regression is trying to represent. At what point do you see a switch, a flip, from a non-response to a response, a positive response. So the predictors are the same as you might have in any other regression. In this case, the predictors are simply what temperature might be there. You could have more than one predictor. It might be temperature and moisture or something like that. So the curve represents that predicted probability change, that switch from zero to ones. And obviously, a less clear pattern than the one you see here in this graph might lead to a less uh, abrupt transition like we see in this graph. It's a fairly steep slope. Well, if you saw a lot of dots that come way over here to the right at the bottom and a lot of dots at the top that come way over to the left, it would be less obvious that there's a switch and so the pattern might not be so clearly represented by a curve. So there are possibilities called multinomial regressions, which means that you have lots of possible stair steps between 0 and 1. They might be values at 0 0.2, 0 0.4, etc. We're going to set those aside here and just deal with the binary cases. Now, the word logistic sounds like or has been used in perhaps in other contexts that you've heard about. There is a logistic growth model that represents a similar S-shaped kind of curve that's used in population demography kinds of senses. You might have seen those kinds of equations before. Um, we're not talking about that kind of a model. It's, a, it's built similarly in its math, but uh, for a different purpose here. Remember that that's predicting population size across many possible numbers on that y-axis. We're talking about only binary data, although the equation is roughly similar. We're also not going to be confusing this with logistics, which is the process as of moving things from an Amazon warehouse to your house, for example, or logistical operations. For example, that's a terminology you hear in the military, or to be confused with logic, or even uh, rappers who have assumed that stage name. So we're talking about logistic regressions, all right? just specifically for binary data. And when we use them, then obviously, when we only have that binary or categorical response variable, when we're talking about unique values of these explanatory variables for each case. So for example, for each county in the US in the recent election, there would be data associated with uh, population size of that county or even of zip codes. Um, maybe the population size of the region, what region you might be in. Were you in the Midwest? Were you in the Southeast, etc.? Um, the ages, the average ages of the populations, what genders, ethnicity mixes, etc. So each cell, each county, each row in your data 
has values to try to explain the binary response. In this case, was it red or was it blue? And obviously in this map, they're showing some distinctions, deep blue or slightly red. I'm talking about just simply red or blue binary, okay? So we have to have explanatory variables for every case where we have a zero or a one, in this case on the map, a red or a blue, okay? So we're trying to explain the zeros, we're trying to explain the ones. Now, the underlying math is something you might have seen before. It is based on a Bernoulli distribution. It's a binomial distribution, not to be confused with the negative binomial distribution we've been working with already as a skewed approach to a Gaussian distribution. Negative binomial being sort of related to the Poisson in a way. This is just simply binomial, to not to be confused with negative binomial. We're, we're not messing around with all these other alternatives now. That's it. It is just binomial. No playing around with alternative distributions like we've been doing recently in class, where we're talking about this fairly simple equation, where f of x is just simply the probability of success. Success being the way it's described in statistical jargon. That would be our ones, okay? So it's simply 1 divided by 1 plus e raised to this linear model. You should see that's a linear model. You have an intercept and a slope term in there times x, okay? So this underlying math is really pretty straightforward. If we have this f of x relative to the opposite, the 1 minus f of x, we're simply expressing the success rate, remember that was the distribution for successes, relative to the failures, okay? And it turns out in the math that the success to failure ratio, or the odds of success, is simply that e to the linear model. So e to the b1, e to the b1 there in that equation, is the odds ratio. Remember, that's essentially an intercept, b0. Be, I should say beta, shouldn't I? Beta 1 or beta 0. Beta 1 is like saying the slope coefficient in a linear model. So e to the beta 1 is the odds ratio, the chance that you're going to see some sort of a success relative to a failure. So just like a linear slope in a regular linear equation, one step increase in x, your explanatory variable, ch causes this e to the beta 1 uh, increase in the chance of success, okay? So we're actually going to be interested in what e to the beta 1 is because that tells us how much does x cause a change in the y axis, all right? So the switch we're talking about can be quite, quite variable, as I alluded to before. It can be fairly abrupt if your histograms pretty much make a market transition at some intermediate value. You see a switch from histograms at the bottom to histograms at the top. There are no values of absences or probabilities of zero, I should say, at the higher values of height here. Or it might be a bit fuzzier, and you see that the line that you get in between then is not quite such an abu abrupt shift. It's a progressive tendency towards the upper value, but notice that the distributions overlap quite broadly here at the top than they do at the bottom. So it's not obviously as marked a transition. And in some extra R code, we could be clever enough to come up with error bars around our graph as well, I actually got that from a website where somebody worked rather hard at coming up with that graph. But this is also representing a distribution of points that are mostly to the left versus mostly to the right in this graph. Okay. Now, I'm doing all these as if they must progress up to the top, upper right. Now, it could be the opposite. You could have a bunch of points over here on the left, and then it slides back down the opposite direction in a, in a lower shaped S curve. Okay. So we can have curves go either going up or down, and so that's sort of represented here. There was this pretty famous paper by Bland Finley in 2002, cited 1,100 times or so already, where uh, he argued that above about a millimeter or so, the organisms tend to, uh, the even tiny organisms, tend to have a biogeography, whereas though they're less than a millimeter, like protists, would tend not to have a biogeography, and predicted that we should have these clear uh, S-shaped patterns, in other words, logistic patterns. So they have no biogeography or they have a biogeography was the argument. Well, so an example, I said, okay, then let's do a logistic regression on that. In fact, I was debating that this could be the case. And so the hypothesis would be that the macrobes, things greater than a millimeter, would have a logistic shape to their, cur to their uh, pattern. And just in the literature where people said, did they find species had a biogeography or not? These were the patterns. There's a bunch of points across the top 
a bunch of organisms of different sizes. People said clearly there's a biogeography, and some points at the bottom where people said there was no biogeography. And as you might guess, that's a pretty fuzzy pattern. There was no slope. There was none of that e to the beta 1 coefficient that was significant. And in fact, then if you fit a linear pattern to it, the intercept was around 0.87 up here. In other words, we can say basically everything seems to have a biogeography. So we can talk about curves going down. We can talk about curves going up. In this case, we just simply analyze the flip side on whether or not they had a biogeography. Okay? So an example in R might be something like this. Let me just drop this up here. So we're looking at the R Studio package, which you guys should be familiar with by now. And I'm playing with a data set called Occupation that comes from Crawley's rather large R book. He has data available online. And so I've already attached that data It looks data set. It looks like this, where we have a number of resources. Those are our predictors. And whether or not sites were occupied, occupied, haha, <laughs> occupied. And so if I scroll down, eventually see some of them become ones. So we have these values that might predict whether a species was occupying a site or not. Okay, So I've written out my simple script here. And I'm going to walk through this with you. I just call this logic model. And notice we're doing a GLM, Generalized Linear Model. You've used these already. This allows us to play with the various distributions, right? Well, one of them that we had not actually messed with was the binomial distribution. Let's see, we did negative binomials, we did Poissons, we did Gaussians. Now we can just simply say binomial here. And all I'm wanting to know is whether or not occupied is predicted by resources. And I use the binomial distribution. So if I run that right there, and then I just ask for the summary, I get this output. Let me stretch that a little bigger. You can see what I got. And so we have uh, the general kinds of output that we've seen before. Here's measures of the residuals. I can tell that they look yeah, pretty balanced, top and bottom, not bad. Um, and I can see that there is a significant uh, predictor here. This is that linear model, essentially, that's set, that's described. Uh, and the exponent to this term is what we'd be interested in. So it shows that that's a significant term. It looks like we do have a real um, sigmoidal shaped um, negative, uh, I'm sorry, not negative, a binomial distribution here where it would be a um, logistic regression that would be working pretty well. We get an AIC score, etc. So if I want to plot that, that's what the rest of my code shows here. First, what I need to do is make up an x axis. I choose variables that are a sequence from the minimum resource value to the maximum resource value in steps of one. So I'm going to make up a new x uh, variable right there. I'm just going to call it x axis. And my y axis is just simply the predicted values from my model. And I'm going to list those for each value of the x axis. And just so you can see, I'm just saying it's also a type response. Okay? So I'll make that. Now I just simply plot that and, and then uh, put the lines on. So let me make this a little wider so we can make the graph show up well. Let's stretch it up there. OK, so here comes the plot. That's the points. And you can see that where the zeros and the ones sat for occupied relative to the resource axis. And like some of the other plots we've seen, most of them tend to be on the left at the bottom. And most of them seem to be at the right for the occupied value. And finally, drum roll, here comes the lines. That is our fitted model. So it looks like a pretty decent model. We have the terms to specify the model here, and in fact, calculate the odds and the odds ratio if we want to. That's just the way, we're, in fact, we're supposed to be able to describe our uh, logistic models. So you've seen how to do it in R. It's really pretty simple, especially if you've already been using GLMs. You've seen this kind of syntax before. All right. So the bottom lines for logistic regressions, I would say that it's a fairly straightforward, simple approach if we're dealing with simple binary logistic models. And it's used for predicting those categorical responses to various predictors. We use a GLM, just like you've seen with other ones. But in this case, we use the binomial family, where you might not have used that before. The e to the beta 1, or exponent beta 1, as you might express it in R, is the odds ratio. This is the way to describe the effect of x on y. You actually extract that from that model output. The, it's really a widely used approach for binary responses, which we collect more than you might have thought based on what we've been doing so far this semester, where we've been focusing on other kinds of data. And like I mentioned, you can get pretty fancy with multinomial logistic models and lots of possible explanatory x variables. The data set I was playing with obviously was pretty simple, where we were just looking at 
uh, one x to explain one uh, y variable that was binary. You could have a non-binary multinomial here, but you can have many, many versions of x uh, explanatory predictor variables as well. And of course, then you're getting into other um, model comparison kind of approaches like we've been using all semester to decide which of your explanatory factors might be more parsimonious than other ones. Okay, that's about all I have to say about logistic regressions. We're going to work with these in class. As I hope you see here, they're fairly straightforward. Um, the thing to really remember is that we come back to focusing on that e to the beta 1 to explain the odds ratio. That's really a simple calculation to make once you've obtained your data. All right? That's it for now, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.